My girl's like candy, a candy treat. She knocks me hot up off my feet. She's so fine as can be. I know this girl is meant for me. Hello, Home Slices. This is Kiara with Home Slice Adulting coming to you as promised with my review for BET's The New Edition Story. The first thing we have to do is to give major props to BET for actually putting something on their network that we wanted to see. I feel like they built the appropriate hype around it, that they had the proper cooperation from the members of New Edition, they had all the rights to the songs, the production was not cheap, they had actors that we knew and loved in the uh, production, so I feel like they did a really good job it wasn't one of those cheap lifetime biopics like the Aaliyah story or the Whitney Houston story that nobody actually saw so they did a great job with that being said though there are two complaints that I have the first one is that I wished that the actors looked a little bit more like the actual members of the group now had I not been taking notes I don't know if I would have been able to keep track of who was who because they really didn't look like the person who they were portraying but whatever the second complaint that I had is that they used the voices of the actors instead of the recorded voices of the actual members of New Edition when they were singing in the show. So for instance, whenever Johnny Gill's part came up to sing, the actor who was portraying him, who was Luke James, actually sang the words on the movie instead of lip singing to Johnny Gill's actual voice. So Luke James sounded a little bit like Johnny Gill, but you can definitely tell it was Luke James singing. So that kind of put me in a, in a different mind state. It was very noticeable to me that these guys didn't necessarily sound like the actors that they were portraying. That bugged me a little bit. I don't know if I'm the only one who's bothered by that. But um, the only person who I could not tell if the actor was actually singing was the guy who played Ralph. Now, um, I don't know if they actually used Ralph's voice or the actor's voice in that case, but everybody else, the actor's voice was used during the singing portions of the show. But anyways, let's go ahead and get started. We start off with part one. It is 1997. We are on the Home Again tour and a huge fight breaks out, which we will come back to because the show goes full circle. So we go back to 1978 and the Orchard Park Projects in Boston, Massachusetts. We meet a young Ricky Bell, aka Slick, who is friends with uh, a little Michael Bivens, who's a little troublemaker. And they go to a talent show to see the 11 year old Bobby Brown do his uh, debut performance. And Bobby Brown ends up choking and running off the stage <laughs> to his mother. And so the next day, um, they say, you know, we were there at the show. What happened? And he was saying, you know, they were kind of throwing me off. But what would make me feel better for next time is if you guys were on stage with me. Now, it becomes clear during this little interaction that um, <clears throat> Bobby has no intention of not being the star of this group. Um, from this and other things that happened in the show, I've kind of determined that Bobby was the type of person who could not thrive if he was not outshining somebody. But he had no intention of everybody singing in the group. He was planning on being the, the lead singer of the group. And we saw that when he crossed his hands behind his back after Ricky and Mike agreed to join the group with him. So technically it was Bobby Brown's idea to form New Edition and Bobby never lets us forget that throughout the rest of this program. But anyways, they decide, hey, three people are not a group. And that's when we get introduced to Ralph Tresvant. And uh, we see Ralph Tresvant was very into Kung Fu or whatever. And they have a cute little scene where Ralph and Ricky compete for the affections of a little girl named Xena. And they sing Reasons. The reasons, the reasons that we're here. Now, um... I meant to warn you guys of this earlier, but I will be singing quite a bit throughout this review. So, you know, uh, just a little warning. But anyways, you know, all four of them are in the group. Um, they are trying to get their act together, but they don't have any guidance. So the sister of Ricky suggests, hey, if you guys are really serious, y'all need to go talk to Brooke Payne because Brooke Payne is the manager for the Untouchables who are like hometown heroes in Boston. 
So um, they find Brooke Payne in an alleyway and they're like, you know, uh, we want management. He's like, I don't work with kids. And he proceeds to get ready to drive away, but they start performing, you know, in front of his car. I think they do a Jackson 5 song, Maybe I Want You Back, but I can't remember. And he's so impressed that he says, you know, no guarantees, but y'all meet me at the rec center, be on time, and the next time you do something like that in front of my car, I'll run you over. <laughs> So they meet up at the rec center and Brooke is very clear with them about his expectations for the group. He's very clear with them about nobody outshining the other person and that all of the group members are equal. Um, he's very clear that it's going to be very hard work, but if they want it, that they can do it. And he works them really hard, really hard. And, um... I guess it develops, you know, character and work ethic. But they sing Holding On, and y'all, that is my song. Holding on. It's very hard to do when love's gone. And that's no lie. It's my song, y'all. But, um, anyways, Brooke comes up with the name for the group, and he calls them New Edition because they're supposed to be the new edition of Jackson 5. Get it? But, um,. We see that they are gaining some traction. They're performing at a lot of talent shows. They have all of their vocals and their choreography on point, which is great. And so Brooke, you know, whipped them into shape. So uh, Brooke lets them know that, hey, you know, there's another talent show coming up, but it's not for money. And the kids are like, well, why would we do it? <laughs> And he says that the winner of this talent show gets to record a demo with Maurice Starr, who is a singer slash producer. And that if their demo gets big, it can be on the radio and they can bring in a lot of money. So the kids are down and they have a week to prepare. And they perform um, The Love You Save by the Jackson 5. Stop the love you say may be your own. That, uh... <laughs> I love the part where he says, you better look both ways before you cross me. That I love that line, but whatever. Um, we see that Bobby and Ralph kind of take the lead with that song and they do a really good job. And um, unfortunately, somebody else wins. We didn't even get to see who won perform, but somebody else wins. And um, the crowd loves New Edition so much and Maurice sees the potential in the boys. So he allows them to record anyway, despite them coming into second place. So they're in the recording session. They're acting a fool, hitting all the instruments and whatnot and don't know how to act. But Maurice says, there's only four of you, but there are five people in the Jackson 5. And if you are the new addition of Jackson 5, you need five members. And that's when Brooke brings in his nephew, Ronnie DeVoe. Now, initially they weren't with it, but uh, especially because Ronnie was from a different neighborhood than they were, but they all kind of meshed together after they danced together and got in the groove and whatnot. So, you know, they had five members and it was all good. Now it was time to perform and um you know Ricky and Bobby got into a fight inside you know the recording area so Brooke had to take him out and uh, Maurice was like okay I should have let Ralph go first Ralph you go ahead so Ralph gets in and starts singing candy girl you're all my world look so sweet you're a special dream <laughs> And um, it becomes apparent that Ralph is the lead singer slash star of the show. And um, Maurice, you know, feels that way. And so does Ronnie. And Ronnie is like, are there going to be any parts of this song that any of the rest of us can sing? But anyways, Maurice is so taken with little Ralph that he goes to his house and basically says, you know, you can be a star. And Ralph is like, well, I can't leave the other guys behind. They're the ones who brought me into this group. And um, Maurice is just trying to convince him otherwise. And um, he, you know, thinks about it. And then we see this part of the show where he buys Christmas presents for the family. And his mom is upset about that because she feels like she should be able to do that for them. But they can't because they live in the projects and they are impoverished. So um, that inspires Ralph to actually take the recording deal that Maurice offered him, but under the condition that he signs the entire group, which I thought was wonderful, especially the fact that Ralph never told the other guys that he gave up a solo career so that the group could make it. So Ralph became my favorite on um, during this program. Initially, I, I was a fan of Michael Bivens, even though he's the least musically talented, but you know, Ralph became my favorite after watching this uh, movie. 
But anyways, um, they're getting ready to sign contracts and um, the mamas are like, well, what are we talking about financially? And he's like, well, there's a $500 signing bonus and a Betamax machine. And I'm like, $500? I mean, I know this was like 1981, 1982, but $500 don't seem like nothing. But uh, next, you know, um, we see Michael Bivens is kind of at a crossroads because he doesn't know if he wants to pursue music with this group or if he wants to play basketball. And his mother, you know, persuades him to go with the, the money right now, um, which is great because I don't see Michael Bivens uh, making it in the NBA. So... They all signed the contracts. They all stunt in the hood uh, with the new things they were able to buy with the money from their signing bonuses. And it is March 1983 and we hear Candy Girl on the radio and they're dancing to it and they're like, yeah, you know, everybody in the neighborhood is dancing to our song and whatnot. But um, next we see they're getting ready to perform at a place called Roseland, which I don't know the significance of, but Curtis Blow was also performing and he was supposed to open for a new edition. And Curtis Blow was like, I'm not opening for no little kids and he was kind of mean to him and the kids were like why is he being like that and Brooke was like well he's threatened because you guys are number one on the charts and Michael Jackson is number two and I was like how cool is that but um next we see the mamas showing up at Brooke's house and they're saying these kids have the number one song on the radio however they are unable to pay for lunch at school why are we still living in the projects and Brooke doesn't know too too much about why they're still living in the projects because apparently Brooke was still living in the projects too <laughs> but he said enough for them to back off long enough for them to wait for the money to all roll in so um the mamas just were very upset about it but you know at this point there was nothing they could really do about it so they go on this candy girl tour and this is the part of the program where all of the the, the children actors turn into the um, older actors and they're just singing come on mama now it's when I'm with you <laughs> and um we see they have adoring fans and we have girls looking bus windows. Oh, that was so nasty when the girl licked the bus window. Yuck. But uh, anyways, they come back from a world tour just to come home to the projects, y'all. And next thing you know, we see a check for $1.87. $1.87. And the mamas are pissed. Um, which they should be. But, um, you know, the same thing happened with them as, you know, Tony Braxton and so many other recording artists is that basically all of the money for your expenses, um, where you stay, your transportation and um, the food that you eat and all of the costumes and all of the set designs and everything, all that money is loaned to you. And when you make your money, all of those expenses are deducted and whatever is left goes into your pocket. And in this instance, it was only a dollar 87 to be split between five people now um the mamas were so pissed off that they voted brooke out of his managerial position and the only person who was opposed was brooke's sister who was ronnie's mom and um they decided to get a new manager and they settle on this white dude named gary because he convinces them that he knows the business side more so than brooke does and can make sure that dollar 87 checks never come back never work their way back into this little circle of mothers um so he makes all those promises and they decide to go with him it is now 1984 they go to mca records and gary convinces them to sing popcorn love um on their way up to mca they meet gerald gerald is very nice to the boys but gerald pulls gary to the side and he said you were supposed to go give me some pop stars who are these ghetto kids that you just brought in here doing a minstrel show <laughs> That was a little funny to me. But, um, you know, Gary has a little pressure on him to convince Gerald that these guys can really be pop stars. But um, next we see this little orgy party going on that Gary walks in on and he's like, what the heck is happening here? And that little orgy party is the exact reason why Gary is introducing them to their chaperones, whose names I don't remember because they're kind of insignificant. But um, apparently he needs to have handlers for these kids because he doesn't want them going too out of control. 
Um, and next we see uh, they're in the studio and Ralph is doing the majority of the vocals. So the other guys are like, hey, they don't need us. We'll go to the mall. So they leave Ralph there and Ralph comes home to their shared apartment and they didn't get any food for him or anything. And they're like, you know, as a lead singer, we thought you weren't going to be hungry. So we see that there's a power dynamic going on between Ralph and all the other guys. So that's unfortunate. But it happens in every group almost every group but um that's it for part one she knocks me high up off my feet she's so fine as can be i know this girl is meant for me